Hello and welcome everyone. Appreciate you uh, getting online today for our webinar. We're going to wait just a, a few more uh, seconds to allow anyone else to join before we get started. If you need anything, please let me know in the Q&A. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and begin. So thank you again for those of joining. I appreciate you logging in today for today's webinar, Using Data Systems to Increase Accessibility in Disease-Specific Research. We are recording today's session, so we do hope that you can stay for the duration of today's event. However, if you cannot, we will be recording and archiving this for later viewing. If you need to use the transcription feature, you can enable that in, on your own screen uh, individually by clicking on the CC button on Zoom and using either show or hide subtitles. The Q&A is open throughout the duration of today's event. I encourage you to enter questions for our, our panelists and presenters today and questions on the topic at hand. Also, if you need any assistance on technical things in Zoom, please enter that there and I'll be happy to assist you troubleshooting with there. Again, thank you so much for being here and I will hand things over to our presenters and panelists to get us started. Thanks, Shane. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Megan Carnes. I'm a genomics research scientist at RTI International an independent nonprofit research institute dedicated to improving the human condition. I want to welcome you to today's Tech Talk, Using Data Systems to Increase Accessibility in Disease-Specific Research, which is the seventh webinar in the RTI Tech Talk series. The Tech Talk series is designed to highlight key innovations across our institute, and we're very thankful to have you with us today. We're going to be talking about multifactorial complex human disease, which require a variety of approaches and data types to best understand disease etiology and drive discovery. Combining data types across diff different disciplines produces more accurate and impactful insights that can transform both research and treatment. However, data are often siloed and sharing is difficult due to variability in file formats and differences in metadata. To combat these challenges, RTI developed the MAP MECFS data portal in collaboration with the Myalgic Encephalomyelitis or, and Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, MECFS, Research Network, and the National Institutes of Health. And the portal is designed to facilitate data sharing and findability using custom smart search tools that MECFS researchers can browse, share, compare, and download biological and clinical data sets within one specific disease repository. After today, we'll hope you'll learn more information about the tool and how it's utilized by the research community and how similar tools can be implemented in other disease-specific research areas to benefit your studies. Next slide, please. Today, you'll be hearing from myself, the um, MECFS Network MPI of an expertise in genomics, Alex Harding, who is our MAP Systems Project Manager and Lead Developer, and Dr. Ravi Mather, who is our um, Systems Lead Bioinformaticist, who has expertise in multi-omic data analysis. For today's presentation, I'm going to start by introducing MECFS, which is a complex multifactorial disease, followed by the MAP MECFS tool that we designed to help the research community. I'm then going to pass it to Alex Harding, who will do a live demo and describe more about the um, system framework. And then finally, Ravi Mather will tell us more about how we are re-implementing this tool in a dis different disease area. Myalgic encephalomyelitis, or, or MECFS, is a serious long-term illness that affects many body systems and is often limits people to um, limits their usual daily activities. A key feature of the disease is post-exertional malaise, which is the worsening of symptoms following mental and physical activity. People with MECFS have severe fatigue and unrefreshing sleep. Up to 2.5 million Americans may be living with MECFS, although the number may be much larger as the disease may, often goes undiagnosed. Additionally, disease etiology is poorly understood. To improve our understanding of the MECFS disease etiology, the NIH established the MECFS network. During the first cycle of this collaborative agreement, the network was comprised of multiple collaborative research centers and other interest groups. As the Data Management Coordinating Center, or DMCC, here at RTI, we aim to facilitate MECFS collaboration communication, and enhanced data sharing. 
One of our tasks was to build an infrastructure to support secure sharing of a wide range of biological and clinical data types, both within the network and with the broader research community, which led us to the development of the MAP MECFS data portal that we're going to be talking about today. Next slide, please. One of the primary reasons that we need to needed to develop a tool to promote data sharing in this research community is demonstrated by this multi-omic figure that you may have seen before. When you have a disease of unknown etiology, it is essential to apply multiple clinical experiments across, across a variety of disciplines to gain insight into disease perturbations. However, if you solely focus on a single data type, you could draw incorrect conclusions. I'd also like to demonstrate something not shown in the original figure. So you can click, please. Thank you. Um, researchers in the same discipline do not always find the same result. Therefore, it's important to compare across multiple studies to look for a pattern. So for example, the first research researcher in red incorrectly concluded that this elephant's tail is a rope. Subsequent findings indicate that in fact, it's a tail. So when multiple studies begin to draw the same conclusion, it give you, gives you increased confidence in those results. Therefore, it's critical that we look across studies of similar design and essential to compile all the available data to get a more holistic view of a disease. Next slide, please. Therefore, we designed the MAP MECFS tool to solve some common challenges for researchers. For example, a researcher may say, I don't know where to go for MECFS specific data. And that's because um, Data are often siloed into different repositories, and sometimes that's by data type and not disease. So we created the portal to be a comprehensive repository of MECFS related data. Additionally, data sharing is often time consuming because data files are complex and variable. Um, researchers often apply different tools, and this can result in a variety of different output files. We combat that by creating an easy to use step-by-step -step upload form with pre-populated fields. This also helps ensure um, standard nomenclature, no, nomenclature within the site. And we've also allowed for flexible file structures and data types. And then lastly, as we just saw, it's essential to compare results across multiple studies to draw biological conclusions. So we created um, custom smart search tools that you'll be hearing more about today as well as curated MECFS specific data from the literature to enable quick cross-study comparisons. So in other words, um, MECFS, MAP MECFS was design, designed to be a one-stop shop for researchers to share new MECFS data, search existing data sets, compare study results, and of course, download relevant files of interest. Next slide, please. So this circle diagram is located on our homepage and it depicts the type of data that we have on the site. And the larger the circle is um, representative of the more, more of that data type on the site. Um, so you can see that we designed it to host many biological and omic data types, such as um, RNA sequencing, proteomics, and others. We also have health, demographic, and survey data, which represents our clinical and epidemiologic study data. And if data does not fit into one of these pre-designed buckets, we have the other, other data type, which allows um, the flexibility to share any type of data file. Um, click, please. So currently on the site, we have 61 public data sets, um, a number of more private data sets, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, well over um, 300 result files and 119 site users from across the globe. All right, so data on the site are Posed, comprised into a data set. And a, a data set is really a combination of different file types as we're showing here. Um, so a data set can have a data file, which represents sample level information. So you would have analyte measures from the lab in a data file. A phenotype file represents 
um, participant level data. So this is typically, um, you would have a participant ID and things like age, case status, or other demographic variables. We have supporting files, which can be, you know, any other documentation that you think um, is needed to make your data set more useful. And that can include links to other websites. And then lastly, we have result files, and we'll look at that in a second, but these are indicative of post analysis um, results. The other thing I want to point out on this screenshot is that we've actually used in the search bar um, the gene IL-6. And so one of the most unique features of the tool is that um, you can search a gene or an analyte of interest and the search space goes beyond just the title or description or metadata. We're actually searching within the data files and result files. So in this case, when we searched IL the IL-6 gene, we identified data sets where that gene had been analyzed. Next slide, please. I mentioned result files, and this is one of um, the key file types on the site. Again, these are post analysis files. So generally you've, you've gathered your um, analyte data, your demographic data, and you've done um, some sort of statistical analysis. A result file is going to contain something like an effect size and a p-value or an adjusted p-value. Um, this file type is very flexible, but again, it's um, we do search these um, molecules and, and enable that to improve findability across the site. Um, and one benefit to this is um, if you were to want to look at other studies that had analyzed your gene of interest, if you did that search in PubMed, you'd be searching the data um, manuscript titles and abstracts. And again, we're taking this one step deeper to allow you to really search across multiple studies. Um, and this is also done using our Explorer tool that you'll see in a little while, which will actually compile all of the res results across the um, site. Next slide, please. I mentioned our easy to upload um, system, and this is just a screenshot showing the step-by-step -step workflow. The other thing I wanted to point out um, about our system here is that the um, selections change based on your data type. Um, so in this case, I've selected that we want to upload DNA methylation data, and that has changed our options for both the assay and measurement to DNA uh, methylation specific choices. And this has two benefits. One is it's easier for the data uploader, and it also controls the vocabulary on the site. Next slide, please. You'll be hearing much more about our custom tools, um, but I want to introduce the molecule tagging tool, which is where data that are uploaded are tagged with known synonyms. And again, this is to increase findability on the site. The way this works is um, that if a gene has a known set of synonyms, we tag that on the back end, and that enables two users to come to the site with different terms that mean the same thing, and they will find the same set of data. Next slide, please. So now I'd like to introduce a bit about the website structure. When users join the site, they are grouped into organizations and organizations determine what data a user can see. So in this example, we have two organizations, a blue and a red. So let's say that user two uploads data that is by default kept as a private data set. And what that means is that other users in that organization, in this case, user one, would be able to view that data. But user three, who is part of a different organization, would not have access or be able to view the data. Once um, the researcher is ready to share more broadly, they have the option to request that the private data goes public we then um, have an internal QC process, and that is essentially to check that um, all the data are de-identified. So the site um, is really designed to only house de-identified data. And then once it's made public, it's viewable to anyone on the site who, who has access to the site. Um, and so um, you'll see examples of that later on the, on the demo, but I just wanted to explain the two different terms and how um, the organizations are used to share data with others in your group or externally. So with that, I will pass it to Alex. He will show some of these features that we discussed live on the site. Thanks, Megan. 
So my name is Alex Harding. I'm a senior software developer um, in the Center for Data Science and AI here at RTI, and I've been leading the development of this tool for the last five years or so. And I will transition over to a demo of our tool. So what you're seeing here is the homepage for MapMECFS. There's some introductory text, a number of different options across the top, a search bar, and this visualization that Megan talked about earlier. And just to show, this is a dynamic visualization. So each of the smaller uh, bubbles within the larger bubbles show the number of tags, uh, which is one of the search features in each of these data types. So from here, we'll take a quick look at our about page. And our about page is where we've compiled all of our information about how this tool works. Uh, a lot of what Megan was saying earlier, a lot of what I'll show you today, but also some more in-depth information in terms of how we do things like uh, our data processing uh, pipeline or how we use our uh, tagging system to pull in different data types and different databases used for synonyms and everything like that. So if you have any questions about how the tool works, those can likely be answered on the about page. And that's where we direct people uh, to start. Also to show, when we return to our homepage here, there are two main options from the top, exploring data and uploading data. For this demo, we're mostly gonna look at exploring data, but just to emphasize what Megan was showing us, we do have our upload form where you'd be able to upload your own data. And this has a title, description, tags, which actually uh, automatically hints based on what you've typed into the description field, as well as a number of different uh, data elements that are all present here for you to use. And like Megan was saying, when you choose a data type, different metadata populates in that form. This also walks you through the upload process for the multiple file types as discussed. So you can get your data file, your phenotype file, results files, any supporting files, and add metadata about those files as you upload them. But returning back to search, you can see here I've typed in tspan6. This is a gene that we're searching for, uh, which is enabled by our search terms um, tool that Megan had described. It's showing up with five different data sets here that have come up, um, and we can try and take a look into why. So if we look at this uh, data set, this is the first result pulled up here. Um, well, actually, before that, let's just show uh, for search, we have a couple of different options to go through here. You have tags that you can use to winnow down your search, as well as on the left, a number of different facets, sort of like the Amazon shopping experience. You can click through and say only things from RTI, only gene expression, uh, only these tags, and, and narrow your search space that way. But if we were to go to this first data set here, this uh, GSE 14577, we get this page that shows the data that's been uploaded about in this data set. So on the left here, we have the organization. This is uploaded at RTI because this is one of the public data sets that we have access to. We have our tags, our case definition, data type, comorbidities, MECFS characteristics along the left side here. We have our description up at the top, the different files that have been uploaded. So this particular data set has a data file, a phenotype file, and two supporting files, one of which is a PDF, and the other is a hyperlink that goes out to a different page on the web. You can see for each of these files, there's two options. Uh, there's preview and download, and we'll take a look at those in just a second. We also have the uh, files that have been created by MapMECFS that we have automatically. We have our search terms, which is the record of the terms we've extracted from the data and or results files, as well as the calculated summary statistics we've put together by merging the data file and phenotype file. On the bottom here, we have all the rest of the metadata that may have been uploaded here um, that is not featured on the left side. Another uh, really nice feature is that we actually have versioning on these tools. So if we were to click this activity stream tab here, we would actually see all of the different edits that have been made to this public data set. And you can actually click into those changes. So here you're able to see that a number of different users of the site have made changes to this data set over time, and you can even see what those changes are. So it keeps a record over time of uh, what has changed in a particular data set. So going back to it, let's say we wanted to preview the data file. Preview is a feature of the tool that takes the file that's been uploaded, in this case, a, a tab separated uh, tabular data file, serializes it into a database and makes it searchable. So now we see this file had 22,283 records. If we were to type in tspan6, it searches these records and shows us just the relevant rows based on the search that we've put in. This is the data file that we were looking at, um, but we can also take a look at the phenotype file. 
which has the participant IDs and the phenotype, the case control status, where the sample has come from. And a lot of these different headers are things that we have specified. They're necessary for us to do our summary statistics or our search terms. And we do have um, SOPs on how all of that works available on our About page. If we were to return here and then take a look into the calculated summary statistics, that's what these look like. You can see that we've um, pulled these together and come up with counts based on the phenotype and done a couple of different statistical tests. And we can do the same kind of search because this has been previewed as well, and we're able to see just those rows. And if we're wondering how we got these genes, how we're able to search this, we can actually look directly at the search terms file that was created by MAPMECFS. So here we're able to see all of the different terms. If we were to search for just that T-SPAN6, we can see here that T-SPAN6 is the gene that's been pulled out, um, but there are a number of different synonyms based on the NCBI gene database that we've used to uh, do synonym matching with our search terms tool. So we're able to see that if a user is to search T-SPAN6 or T-SPAN-6 or TM4SF6 or T245 or what have you, um, this search will come back the same either way. So that's a way for people who speak different languages in terms of their uh, gene names to all be able to use this tool together. And last and related, I'll show the results file explorer tool, which has also done a search for T-SPAN 6 here, as Megan uh, was talking about. This lets us actually query into um, all of the data across everything you have access to. So here we've searched for T-SPAN 6. We get a nice little visualization showing uh, what files are on the, the site. And in here, we're able to see on this top table the um, summary statistics for all results on the site. If we were to search for that, I think it was GPL 96, we're able to see just the rows from that data set we were looking at. And additionally, in this bottom table, we're able to see for the results files that have come up for um, the, the search as well. So this is our way for you to search directly for a gene and see exactly what data was in the files that are uploaded rather than looking at the uh, full data sets themselves. So with that, I'll go back to our slideshow, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the framework we used to build this system and how we went from, you know, kind of this raw tool to MAPMECFS. So the framework we use for this is called CCAN. CCAN is an acronym for Comprehensive Knowledge Archive Network, and it's an open source data portal framework built in Python. But when I say uh, data portal framework, it's not your regular kind of web framework like Django or Flask or React or Vue or any of those things you may have heard of. It's actually a fully featured site, a full stack application that's given to you with a number of different ways to customize. So it has opinionated data storage with a database uh, in Postgres. It's got a robust CRUD, which is create, read, update, and delete structure with role-based user controls. So users have different roles within organizations that provide uh, you ways to administrate users. There's a full data REST API that we'll talk about in just a second that allows people to programmatically interact with the data on a CCAN tool. Um, and like I said, it's a full stack application. It comes with an HTML and JavaScript front end. So you have a full web tool that you can interact with on the web right out of the box. And notably, it has an extension architecture as well as a community of extensions that allows people to build their own tools that work in CCAN and also share those tools with the community so that other people can consume them. It was authored by a company called the Open Knowledge Foundation, but it's recently moved to a bilateral community stewardship in which other organizations are also um, in charge of CCAN and the code. It's used for a number of open data portals built by the US, Canadian, Australian governments, to name a few, and that includes data.gov, which is one of the premier open data portals on the web. So to give an overview of how CCAN works, uh, including some screenshots from just a demo vanilla instance of CCAN, CCAN allows users to upload any files or web URLs as resources. So resource is the term for anything that's been uploaded by a user. Resources belong to data sets, which are groups of resources that have shared metadata. Data sets belong to organizations, which have members, those are the users of the site, with different levels of permissions. On the left here, we see a screenshot of the preview, like we saw in the demo. Resources that are uploaded to CCAN can be processed for preview, and that includes tables, which we saw in our demo, but it can also include visualizations, visualization building tools that allow users to query into the data and build their own charts, uh, maps for geospatial data, and a whole lot more, including PDF readers, image readers, that kind of thing. CCAN also provides that web-facing search interface that we were looking at. 
This tool allows users to search data sets and resources using a combination of full text search, tags, and faceted search. CCAN also provides an HTTP REST API, which allows users to programmatically interact with the data within. Uh, and it also allows developers to interact with CCAN for more advanced front end tools like visualizations and more uh, impactful interfaces. And CCAN provides a robust extension API, which allows de software developers to add functionality to CCAN. Um, but because CCAN is about openness and is itself open source software, in the spirit of that, many developers, us at RTI included, have chosen to make their work open source and available. So on the right here, this is a screenshot of a great list that CCAN has maintained on GitHub of a number of different tools that are available uh, freely on the web for you to use in your CCAN instance. We ourselves have a number of different extensions that we use in our Map MECFS tool. Uh, we do have one not shown here, which is just our Map MECFS extension that handles things like styles and, and uh, metadata, but there are six that are worth talking about. On this left column in the user facing side, we have our summary statistics uh, extension, which generates descriptive statistics based on user supplied data. And that's publicly available on GitHub. Um, this uh, link works, so you'll be able to get that from our presentation, which will be downloadable. We have our search terms extension where data undergoes synonym matching to improve data findability, which is also publicly available. We have our results explorer, that explorer tool that we looked at, which compiles results across data sets to compare and visualize data for multiple studies. And on the less user facing side, we have an advanced auth package, which is also publicly available that adds a number of security features to CCAN, including protecting data from unregistered users, initiating a new user workflow rather than just allowing self-serve uh, sign-in, and the ability to make uh, changing data sets from private to public a administrator option rather than um, just being something that's publicly available. We also have an audit explorer tool, which gives us data access logs and enables us to respond to data security and quality issues very quickly and a QA checker tool that we've built that automatically checks the data sets on Map MECFS to identify some common problems so that our administrators can fix them rather than having users discover them. We're also working on a new tool that I believe we're supposed to be releasing in the next week um, called the data integration tool. And this tool is for clinical data and this allows users to select any of the forms that have been uploaded, um, select variables from those forms and a key to join on and then create their own data set that they can download and use for analysis based on the clinical data that's been uploaded to Map MECFS. One of the other things that RTI has spent a lot of time on is the cloud infrastructure for Map MECFS. This diagram isn't exactly up to date, but shows some of the work that we've done to leverage uh, Amazon AWS services to put together a very performant and redundant and reliable and cost-effective solution for hosting our CCAN-based open data portals, which we've reused across other projects. But this was definitely a journey. Like I said, when I introduced myself, we've been working on this tool for about five years now, I think well, longer. And we used a couple different um, tools to get us there. One is very much human-centered design in which we did user group meetings and got the right requirements. Yeah, our first iteration of this tool worked for a single CSV file and that CSV file would generate summary statistics and, and search terms, but didn't work for anything else, but it was enough for us to show people and get reactions and uh, understand what they did and didn't like about the tool. Same went for our upload process, which went through many iterations and uh, for all of our data collection and, and uh, data types as well. And using that human-centered design thinking in combination with an agile workflow to really release fast iterative features has helped us make sure that this tool works for everyone who needs to use it, but also works for everyone that wants to use it. And now we're building out sort of a map universe, which is a great transition to hand this over to Ravi, because the extensions that we've built and open sourced and our infrastructure and automation that's been abstracted to be more reusable, we can build lots of new data portals in CCAN and inherit all the work that we've done for Map MECFS into a new project with minimal effort. So I'll turn it over to you, Ravi, to talk about some of our next steps. Thanks, Alice. Um, to go to the next slide, um, I am uh, Ravi Mather, a bioinformatician at RTI International. Um, and as um, as Alex, Alex mentioned, uh, the MAP uh, system is 
easily. Um, we can uh, kind of apply it to other projects. So a recent application that we are starting up is um, applying Map OA as the data sharing portal for the Integrative Omics Center for Opioid Addiction Research. And the overall uh, uh, goal for the IOMIC OA uh, Center is to accelerate the neurobiology understanding of opioid addiction. And this is uh, funded by a P50 by um, NIDA. Um, and it's a collaboration across RTI International, Geisinger, Whitehead Institute, and Johns Hopkins. Next slide. And the uh, IOMIC of OA uh, Map OA portal is bringing together several different multi-omic data from a variety of sources. The figure on the right shows the several different components of the center grant with project one integrating uh, EHR, electronic health records, and genomics data, project two with brain gene regula regulation, project three with multi-species approach, including rodent models, project four with gene networks, and all of that coming together with the Synergy Core and an administrative core, and that Synergy Core is where MapOA uh, comes in. We have all of the project data and also publicly available data that we're integrating in and uh, sharing into the MapOA portal. And with those variety of data, the map framework is being adapted to handle more data types. For example, within this project, we're conducting genome-wide association studies and several other integrated analyses, which uh, uh, MapOA is uh, adapting the framework. And um, further of a um, variety of different analyses and um, variations on our data security. Next slide, please. So how is that adaption working? Uh, and this is an ongoing process, as uh, Alex mentioned, the user-centered design and the agile development. We are updating study design metadata, um, which is being updated to reflect opioid addiction as opposed to CSS in the uh, MAP MECFS context that includes phenotype and case definition changes, comorbidities or opioid addiction characteristics. Uh, also, the um, map OA is more centered around summary statistic data um, and handling both summary sample and summary statistics and the um, genome-wide association study. And this is um, kind of a full adaption of the results um, and data file that Megan and Alex uh, mentioned. The analysis met metadata is being adapted for new um, analyses when you have an integrated analysis. You can have several different relationships between data sets, and those relationships we are um, kind of showing out to the user to make it clear of um, what is being integrated. And finally, uh, um, and also uh, data security is being adapted for eventual public consumption. So the map OA is currently in a beta version, but we um, would like to, within the um, period of performance of the project, of uh, have it open up for uh, public consumption. And finally, as um, again, as Alex mentioned, it's all co coordinated with subject matter experts within opioid addiction and um, for um, geneticists. Um, and it's a collaborative effort uh, within that agile development human-centered design framework. Next slide. And throughout the, all of the MAP uh, development, uh, we, we have kept the FAIR guiding principles in mind. FAIR guiding principles was developed to enhance the reuse, reusability of scientific data. Um, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, where findability is the ability for data and metadata to be findable for human and computers. Within MAP MECFS, 
we have unique identifiers for each data set and each data file or resource um, with rich metadata included for each file. The accessibility um, is uh, refers to the data being accessible without the use of specif specified or proprietary tools. As De Alex mentioned, CCAN as a framework is a publicly available uh, tool um, and it's an open, uh, open source uh, database. Um, and also there's a uh, standard uh, browser APIs that um, users can use. Uh, the interoperability is the data integration with applications or workflows. And the standard API and controlled vo vocabulary um, show that the, um, it's interoperable across different uh, uh, systems. Finally, the reusability um, is that it's optimized, how the data is stored is optimized for reuse of that data um, with the data type specific standards and um, domain um, metadata that's shown that controlled vocabulary um, is specific for the data type and for the disease, making uh, make it really clear for reusability um, of the data. So with, um, as I mentioned, the design of the uh, frameworks, both MAP-MECFS and MAP-OA, these uh, principles are uh, kept in mind and we're continuously uh, adding uh, features and um, making improvements to our uh, uh, fair, our fairness, as um, some people refer to it. Um, and um, next slide. Okay. And right. yeah, with, with that, um, feel feel free. Our website is there. Um, contact us there. Um, as Shane mentioned, the Q and A is open. Um, feel free to put in questions within that Q and A. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Alex. Um, again, yeah, as, as Robbie just mentioned, please feel free to use the Q and A and ask questions. I'll just make one correction. The um, P50 grant for the OMICS OA actually includes additional collaborating sites. So feel free to check out our um, web page with all the information about that network. And I will go ahead with some of the questions that we received in the chat. Um, so we got one question, which was who can submit data and what are the QC validation processes used before making it public? Um, and that's a great question and I think kind of fits into our iterative de design because um, it's sort of changed um, and is continuing to change over time. Um, so MAP MUCFS is um, any researcher can submit, so it's not meant to be so only those that are in the network. Um, initially, it was really focused on curating publications and information that was in um, a specific publication. And so that was our primary focus with the sort of use case of we put it in the site, it gets a dedicated URL that you can include in your journal. Um, keeping that data set private, and then before, uh, when your publication is released, we can then make it uh, public. The QAQC process is that we have an internal team of um, bioinformaticists and experts who check again for de-identification, um, and that's described on our about page. And then we were making sure that it was the information that was included in the publication. Um, and then we have a data use agreement that sort of outlines expectations before you share data and what um, and if you use the data. However, um, we are excited to say that we're getting larger and more complex data sets that are not just housed within a publication. Um, we are working to release a large um, cohort study that has over 1200 variables four time points. Uh, which, um, you know, is not part of a one single publication. As we start to expand to these larger complex data sets, we are increasing our processes around that. Um, and we're working on a submitter application form where we will sort of meet one on one and talk about the individual use cases for data sharing. Um, so it kind of depends and it's sort of open to all researchers that are working specifically on MUCFS. Um, I just want to say that 
that is specific to the MAP and ECFS data portal. If we were to sort of expand the tool itself to other um, disease, it really depends on the use case of those researchers. So that credentials that I just described were what we needed for this research field. It's not dependent on the actual software program. So these are sort of external SOPs that we've designed and not unique to the software. Um, does anyone else want to add anything? Yeah, I'll add uh, two points. One, if you want a little more of the nitty gritty about that QA, QC validation process, that is a lot on our about page, which is publicly available. So you can get some documentation on it there. And to Megan's point, um, some of these SOPs are external to the tool itself, but we've also built uh, automation to assist some of these SOPs. And some of that is built plainly within the, the CCAN framework, but a lot of it is captured in our advanced auth package, which is now open source and publicly available. So that's one of the nice things with, with this kind of extension architecture is that if we were to start building another portal for another disease and we decided that uh, it's going to be open to the public, but they don't need they they still need the ability to restrict you know what goes from private to public or something like that. We can just turn that on and off with a few configuration flags by reusing these great tools we've built on MapMECFS. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Megan. Um, we have a question about how MapMECFS differs from the NIAID import data repository and dbGaP, um, and if um, if individuals need to submit data to all these repositories. So I'll start with dbGaP. Um, so dbGaP holds obviously genetic data, which is its own, um, has its own set of rules. And so we would not accept genotype data or um, genetic data that would typically go into dbGaP. Um, what we do, Again, the whole goal for our research community is to make data findable. So we would create a data set within the MapMe CFS site, have all the metadata to make it searchable, have the study description, and then link to the dbGaP accession. So we're not physically holding the identifiable information, but we're still helping the researchers um, find the data. Um, I would say, similar to import, um, we probably have overlapping data types. And I think your choice in this case um, would be dependent on what you're studying. So we are focused again on NECFS data. And so if your funding institution requires that you submit it to a data disease specific repository, it would probably go into map and ECFS. Um, there may be use cases that I'm not aware of where it would make sense to put it into both. And again, we could create a data set to help make it uh, findable. Um, anyone else want to add to how we might work with other repositories? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention, so there's a um, couple of data sets that we have in MapMECFS that has, um, for example, we have geo data sets, the gene expression omnibus, um, where we have links to um, those uh, respective re re um, data sets within that uh, repository within MapMECFS. So you can kind of like um, link the um, data sets across repositories. Yeah, and one, one other thing we've discussed, I think a little more with um, how we're going to do some of the map OA import, but if uh, another tool and our tool both have web APIs, you know, there, there's possibility for automation. You can write a script that interacts with both tools and imports from one to the other or, or something like that. So we haven't had to do that yet, but we've uh, explored enough to know that it's possible. Um, the next question we got is how much um, phenotype data can you upload? Can you upload more than one data set? Um, and the answer is yes, you can upload um, as many as you need to. Um, so that data set that I just mentioned that we're working to release, that is 20 different clinical instruments that were used, and those are all in different phenotype files. The way we've, um, and that's actually what led to the creation of that data integration tool that Alex um, showed a screenshot of. And so we designed that tool specifically for um, that set of data. And um, in that case, we have 20 different phenotype files, again, multiple time points, and a researcher can come in select which um, forms they're most interested in, 
within those forms what variables they want to look at and then export that as a new file. Um, and in terms of how data are combined um, across projects, um, if you're looking at a specific analyte, we have the Explorer tool that we showed. Um, so that's one way data are combined across projects is just through our search um, and then creating the table view of, of those results. Um, the system also has what's known as groups. Um, and this is a way to sort of group data sets together that have something in common. And so when we have a set of data that are coming from a, the, a similar um, cohort or project, we create groups around those. Um, and I'll see if Alex wants to add anything uh, about the technical back end of combining data across projects. Uh, no, no, I think you you covered that well. The organizations and the group features are, are great for that. I do see one aimed to me, so I can give you a break, though. Um, I see uh, one question. Uh, can the CCAN framework be completely limited access, and can it be made secure enough to store PII? Um, for that first question, I'll say yes, it can absolutely be made completely limited access, and that is something that we have provided in our, our advanced auth package. Um, right now, our current workflow on Map MECFS is we've implemented a, a feature in which users can self-register, but once self-registered, they have access to no data until an administrator approves them for access. Um, we could certainly turn that off and have it uh, so that administrators need to create users manually rather than having that limited type of self-registration, then it would be completely closed off. And in terms of being made secure enough to store PII, we have had the great fortune of not having to do that so far. But um, I believe that's absolutely within the capabilities of the tool and the infrastructure that we're using. Um, Ravi, I'll pass this question to you because I know you've worked a lot with our users. Um, do users find data upload difficult and are the are file types stringent? formatting requirements? Do we have stringent formatting requirements? Yeah, so um, formatting requirements, and um, I have a little bit with another question of um, uh, data, the criteria for data for submission um, are pretty loose. Um, we do have a recommended format of uh, yeah, the data phenotype and results file. Um, those do align with um, other repositories formats. Um, and um, other uh, standard formats for um, each of the data types. Um, so it, it is really easy to upload data. Um, as Alex mentioned, there's a multi-step uh, upload form um, and um, the metadata is collected within that. Um, and that makes it really easy to kind of upload data and um, in terms of the formatting, um, it's pretty flexible towards um, uh, towards within the standards of um, kind of uh, flexible towards different uh, data types. Um, I'll, I, I'll grab another question. Um, uh, there's a question of, is any of the data combined or stacked across projects? Um, so uh, one particular example, um, it, so it can be, um, well, uh, particularly in the IOMIX uh, case, there's, um, I, I mentioned integrated analysis. So that integration is across different um, projects of their analyses. Um, and that, that's when I um, mentioned the relationships between the data sets of each uh, project. Uh, would have their own data set and then the integration across them. For example, um, if you do a genome-wide association study and then you do a cross ancestry meta-analysis, each of those would be different data sets. Um, you can have both uh, types. Um, there's a question about um, scientific rigor of data. So um, we require um, that data is either been published in a peer-reviewed journal or it's been approved by our NIH collaborators. Any 
Any other questions? Well, um, just want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, Robbie, did you want to add a final thought? Yeah, I, I was gonna, I just um, saw another question. Um, so in terms of mapping public data to new data, um, so it is at the participant level, um, it is at the sample level. Um, one particular application that we've done for IOMICS is to utilize public data in terms of um, as public control. Um, some of the IOMICS data that we have is case only data. Um, so we've used public data to essentially um, age match, ancestry match, um, those kind of things as uh, control um, for those analysis. Um, so that's uh, one particular application that we're doing for public data. And that's specific to the IOMIC analysis for the map OA, um, we're focusing on sharing summary statistics, which yeah. is not participant level. Okay. Um, thank you so much for attending. Um, and if you have our email address, if you have any follow-up questions and um, look forward to joining on the next talk, tech talk. Bye everyone.